The focus of this video is perihilar cholangiocarcinoma. Cholangiocarcinoma refers to bile duct cancers. Perihilar location, that is at the root of the liver where the bile duct and the blood vessels enter the liver, is the commonest site of cancers that originate in the bile duct. We will find out what it is, what are the risk factors, the symptoms, the diagnosis, managing jaundice, staging the disease, and the treatment options. One of the main functions of the liver, as seen in this cartoon over here, is to produce bile. Bile is produced by the liver cells, which is then transported by bile tubes. These bile tubes congregate into a main left and a right tube to form the main bile tube, which then carries bile right down into the small bowel, passing through the pancreas. Bile is essential in digesting fat. Cancers of the bile tube arise in the epithelial layer. This is the surface lining of the bile tube, and then they congregate and get bigger. As mentioned previously, the hilum of the liver is the commonest site for these cancers. They occur within the liver called intrahepatic or further downstream called distal bile duct cancers. The distal variety of the bile duct cancers behave much like pancreatic cancer and are treated much in the same way. In this cartoon, we see the bile tubes congregating to form a single bile tube, the main bile tube, and those further divisions are called a second order bile duct. Our focus is the perihilar cholangiocarcinoma form 50 to 60 percent of all bile duct cancers. The risk factors include primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is an autoimmune condition of the bile tubes which are then prone to forming strictures both within the liver and outside of the liver which are prone to developing cancers. Stones within the bile tubes and within the liver, liver flukes and cysts of the bile ducts are risk factors for developing hilar cholangiocarcinoma. Hereditary mutations or changes in the DNA are factors of genetic predisposition which are outlined over here and around half of the patients survive surgical excision of bile duct cancers if it has been completely cut out. This diagram further explains the sites of cholangiocarcinoma or bile duct cancer intrahepatic within the liver or outside of the liver the extrahepatic bile duct cancers perihilar being the commonest and then the distal one that is further away towards the pancreas in this area. The main types of perihilar cholangiocarcinoma consist of mass forming or polypoidal where they actually form a small lump. Much more commonly, they are the sclerosing type, infiltrating the bile ducts alone and traveling up and down the bile tubes themselves, and finally, as the name suggests, the nodular subtype. Now, let, now let's look at how this type of cancer spreads. It's both local and metastatic. It's away from the site where it originated from. In this cartoon now, we can see the bile ducts, the black, showing the cancer or the perihilar cholangiocarcinoma and behind the bile duct is the portal vein that brings blood from the gut to the liver dividing into left and right in the red is the artery that supplies the liver through the left and the right branch and worryingly these types of cancer spread linearly up and down the bile tube in a linear fashion, thus moving towards the liver as well as further down and rarely towards the neck of the gallbladder along the bile tubes themselves. They also spread radially around the bile tube and thus involving the blood vessels and infiltrating the blood vessels supplying the liver. This is the reason why the hilum of the liver is such an important area where all the important structures enter the liver. And when these cancers spread both in a linear or a radial direction, they may make treatment much more complicated. These cancers also spread beyond the bile duct at the site of their origin to the liver, forming lumps within the liver. The lymph nodes, which are small nubbins of tissue important in immunity and trapping viruses and regulating lymph flow, they also can catch cancer cells. Typically, they are along the bile duct, but they can be further away in more distant zones, noting metastatic disease. These types of cancers in the later stages spread to the abdominal cavity, to the chest, as well as to the other sites. The commonest symptom of perihilar cholangiocarcinoma is jaundice. Uh, is yellow skin, yellowness of the sclera of the eyes, pale stool, metallic taste in the mouth, feeling weak, and loss of appetite, as well as at times reversal of the sleep wake cycle. Typically, this jaundice is painless, and the patients may have some discomfort in the right upper quadrant of their abdomen. Later on in the disease course, patients may develop symptoms from metastatic disease, such as loss of appetite and weight loss. There may be symptoms associated with the conditions that lead to cholangiocarcinoma that I described previously. Patients with 
with primary sclerosing cholangiopathy, the PSC is a special category of patients who are at heightened risk and typically they describe worsening symptoms, development, development of new jaundice, weight loss, and loss of energy. And when these symptoms are progressive, perihilar cholangiocarcinoma must be suspected in these patients. As the cancer progresses, and stops the flow of bile going through into the bile tube, the bile ducts dilate with excess bile within them that is then transmitted backwards. The liver is not a repository for bile and then this excess is picked up by the blood and it shows up in the eyes, in the skin and in the urine which turns very dark. The primary purpose of the diagnosis is to establish and confirm perihilar cholangiocarcinoma secondarily to assess its spread both radial, linear and metastatic to assess the liver parenchyma and to seek other associated conditions such as PSC and their extent. Scans play a huge part in assessing the condition. The ultrasound scan is usually the first one. This is non-invasive and it uses sound, sound waves which are then recollected and reconstituted as an image. Typically it shows the bile tubes which are far dilated than usual because of the obstruction but it may not show the cancer itself. In this ultrasound picture you can see the dilated bile tubes congregating towards a tumor over here in the hilum of the liver. One of the most useful is the CT scan. As evidenced over here it shows the dilated bile tubes within the liver because bile cannot flow through the stricture. It also shows the mass formed by the cancer and it also involves the blood vessels. The CT scan on its own may well fulfill all of the parameters of the diagnosis that, that I discussed earlier. The CT scan and the CT angiogram that looks at the blood vessels are indisposable part of trying to understand the extent of the tumor and whether or not it's removable with surgery. The MRI scan is the other indispensable part of the tumor because it shows the bowel tubes as well as the liver in a lot more detail and it establishes the extent of the tumor, especially in a linear fashion, to have a good idea. Typically, these cancers extend beyond what is visible on the scans and are more extensive. Over here, you can see the site of the stricture associated with a mass and a dilated biliary tray. CT PET scans are deployed in diagnosis as well as in diagnosing metastatic disease. These are in fact, two scans which are superimposed on each other, involving a tiny dose of radiation to the glucose molecules, which are then in fact, which are then injected into the patient and are picked up by cancer cells. I will discuss the endoscopic route some more in treatment. The endoscopic ultrasound involves inserting a flexible tube through the duodenum, through the stomach, which parks itself right next to the exit point of the bowel tubes. These are much more effective when cancers of the bowel tube are lower down. The distal, the distal cholangiocarcinomas at this site, they are less effective in trying to biopsy the higher cholangiocarcinomas. The ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography involves a flexible tube through the stomach and it parks itself right at the exit point of the bowel tube and then it inserts a camera up the bowel tube which takes direct view of the bowel tube itself and can, and can take biopsies. This is a view from a cholangioscope looking up into the bowel tube with its two divisions seen clearly and this is a healthy bowel tube. This is a cancer that has grown around the bowel tube which is now progressing. It is important to point out that a biopsy is not always essential in providing treatment because detecting the cancer cells can be very elusive. Finally, if endoscopy is not successful, then in most cases of perihilar cholangiocarcinoma, a radiological procedure called PTC is performed where under ultrasound guidance as well as injecting dye called fluoroscopy, x-ray guidance, inflexible wires are inserted into the bile tube that traverse the stricture and then come down into the small bowel. These are then used to insert brushes which, can, which catch cancer cells as well as sometimes a direct biopsy of the site. One of the most important components of management is to treat the jaundice whether or not the tumor can be removed with surgery. Now it is also possible that surgeons may decide to operate without treating the jaundice first but that is less common. Typically jaundice is treated by insertion of stents. These are tubes that lie within the bile tubes themselves and this principle involves two basic types of 
tubes. The plastic tubes, which as the name suggests are made out of plastic, or these are metal tubes, which can be bare metal or mesh metal that once inserted then spring open or they are covered with other material and are removable. The means of doing this are primar primarily either endoscopic or more commonly radiological depending on the unit that is treating the patient. It is conventional, it is thought that hyalurachal angiocarcinomas do not lend, lend themselves easily to treatment through the endoscopic route. I have already shown you pictures of the endoscopic technique. This involves a flexible tube insertion right at the exit point of the bowel tube and then inserting a guide wire through the cancer itself, ideally both on one on the left and one on the right side, and then inserting that lie above the stricture with their bottom ends hanging out into the bowel tube. The radiological approach achieves exactly that. In the percutaneous transhepatic approach, a needle is inserted through the skin across the liver tissue and then a guide wire is inserted into the bowel tube that traverses the stricture and travels all the way down into the small bowel. Perhaps it can be taken at the same time. The stent, depending upon the prognosis of the patients, are then inserted typically on both sides of the liver as shown over here. Patients who are not candidates for surgical intervention are treated with metal tubes such as bare mesh metal stents, ideally both on the right and the left side from the outset to contain the jaundice. Once this is achieved, this by itself is a great means of relieving the main symptom of this cancer, which is jaundice. Fortunately, infections are common and something that have to be prevented during the course of the treatment. The blood tests involve typically the liver function tests to assess the jaundice and function of the liver, as well as the tumor marker C199 as a prognostic indicator. Other tests may be performed to assess physiology of the patient and other comorbid conditions as required. The definitive treatment of perihyalurachalangiocarcinoma is dependent upon tumor factors and patient factors. Tumor factors that predict removal with surgery include localized disease that would allow removal of the tumor safely along with the liver that has either not spread to the surrounding blood vessels or spread to blood vessels in a way that still allows surgery to go ahead but with, but with reconstruction of those blood vessels. Patient factors are just as important because the surgery for perihyalurachalangiocarcinoma is highly complex and requires a good level of fitness going into the surgery to be able to sustain such a big and extensive operation. Now focusing on the surgery itself, typically the perihyalurachalangiocarcinoma surgery requires removal of half a lobe of the liver, the involved segment of the bile duct right down to its junction with the pancreas, all the involved lymph nodes so that everything comes out in one piece. The end result leaves a segment of the liver with its blood supply intact and a segment of the bowel tube hanging out of it that requires reconstruction with a loop of small bowel that is disconnected from here and then is brought up to make a new joint so that bile can flow directly into the bowel again and not be obstructed. This surgery is carried out successfully, then up to 50 50% of these patients can look forward to good quality of life and five year survival. Sometimes prior to the surgical excision, it is estimated that not enough of the liver will be left behind. In that case, a part of the liver that is being removed, its portal venous blood supply is obstructed several weeks prior to surgery to allow the other side to grow some more so that it can function normally and patients are not subjected to liver failure after surgery. Transplantation has been deployed in the treatment of hyalurachalangiocarcinoma, especially in patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis. Initially, it was attempted for good prognosis tumors, but increasingly those that are localized and have not spread beyond the confines where they originate, some reasonable results are being reported. We have to await for long-term data to make a final decision on this aspect of treatment. Regardless of whichever treatment part a patient takes, it's very important to treat and palliate the jaundice effectively and to prevent infection within the biliary tract wherever possible. Chemotherapy is deployed in three settings, adjuvant once tumor has been removed surgically. New adjuvant treatment is sometimes given where patients may have locally advanced disease which is treated with new adjuvant chemotherapy as well as other techniques to grow up the liver to reduce the risk of future metastatic disease and finally patients who are not candidates for surgery are given palliative chemotherapy. The role of radiotherapy as is not as well defined in perihyalurachalangiocarcinoma. However, patients who have incomplete removal of the cancers have been found to have some benefit from radiotherapy after surgery. A couple of decades ago, photodynamic therapy that depended upon developing the oxygen radicals in the vicinity of the tumor using light-activated 
products or that locally this control the tumor and improve the efficiency of the stents and may have had some role in improving quality of life. This completes this complex topic. I've, I hope this has been of help in understanding this condition. If you have any comments, please do share.